Imperial, as a holding group, decided some year ago that Africa is where we have to be. So I just want to cement Imperial's view on Africa. Uh, the focus from Imperial Holdings through Imperial Logistics is Africa. That's where the growth is going to be and that's uh, where we're going to go. Uh, what we did, we initiated an inaugural study to understand the volumes that are moving what we call uh, Southern Africa SADC, if you wish, a regional SADC movement and then transshipments. Those are volumes and values that are coming through the port of Durban currently. In terms of Africa, if you look at the volumes going into Africa, about 85% that comes through Durban goes into Africa. 90% of that's currently on road. Uh, Africa has a view now that, uh, you know, if it is meant for Africa, we also have ports such as uh, uh, Mombasa, such as Matwari, such as uh, Dar es Salaam, such as Nakala, Baira. We can come all the way down and on the western side, the Malthus Bay Corridor. A, uh, a conference was concluded in the latter part of uh, 2010 up in Mombasa, attended by 13 countries, some 15 corridor groups, the United uh, Nations uh, Commission to Africa, United, uh, uh, the United, uh, USAID, uh, the World Bank, and various role players. I don't know if we put that in the presentation, but they were a large group of people that sat down to decide the way forward for the next 10 years in Africa. What came out of that, just very briefly, is, is, is a short, medium, long-term focus and an overview from that conference that was held and, and, and agreed to uh, by, the, by the countries. And the development corridors very strongly currently is Volfus Bay, the Trans Caprivi, Kaneni, the Trans Kalahari. We have removed the Trans Kalahari from the dream, reason being high logistic costs. I mean, to run a vehicle from here to reach its base, some, uh, to Volfus Bay, some 40,000 men. There's no traffic coming back, large imbalances. For instance, uh, Volfus Bay exports about 3.8 million ton, bringing 1.7 million ton. So there's a, a large imbalance which is chasing cost into the logistics system. Uh, the Maputo corridor is the next corridor they're focusing on. Uh, although they've just taken the draft to 11 meters, I think two months from now the draft will be 9.8 again. Uh, Maputo's got a natural silting problem, exactly the same problem as, as Volfus Bay, a major imbalance of traffic. Uh, and then the northern central river ports. There is a big drive in Africa. If you go from Tabuchi by road to Zambia, that's about 4,100 kilometers. If I take a, 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 a goods from Tabuchi and I come through Somalia, Uganda, down to Rwanda, uh, Burundi, and I put it on the lake, that's about 2,000 kilometers and then it's 700 kilometers and I'm at Kaza Bay in the northern Zambia. There are 21 million people living in north, Cong uh, north of the northern Congo. They have no tools, they have no agriculture, they have no work, they live off the land. One way of getting logistics to them is by using Lake Tanganyika and its peripherals to get there. We operate 900 ships in Europe, biggest operators of barges on, on, the, on the river all the way from Kufuren in the Netherlands up to the Ruhr in Austria. So in the group we have the expertise to go. So the focus is we're going to Africa. On the 1st of October they have officially established the Imperial Logistics Africa Division, Chief Executive George De Beer, and uh, as the speaker said earlier, for my sins, uh, I was moved uh, from another division to take over the development of, of, uh, of Africa. Uh, prior history, I was with the Max Steel Group, and in that group I had Africa and Western United States. Uh, in terms of exports, so I have some idea what's happening in Africa. I, I agree with Sally, there are two laws. It's the law of the land, and the law of the country. I don't talk about bribing or corruption, I talk about facilitation fees. We do not participate in, in particip uh, we don't participate on, on facilitation fees. It's extremely clear on what and how we're going to deal with Africa. We have done presentations to the government of Zimbabwe, Zambia, we've just been up to uh, Kenya, we are now getting Burundi, Rwanda, Uganda and Somalia together through the president of, of Uganda. Um, uh, obviously uh, through Ike Barabas uh, from Kenya, who's, who's the brother and, and, and one of the oil magnets up there. But we are taking the product to water. That is the big dream, is to create the gateways. Uh, just a matter of interest, the long-term corridors, the Kala, Bayram, Atwari, and the Bito. In terms of what my colleagues are going to speak uh, on, on the Mozambique side and what Paul has said, it has been put as a long-term corridor because in terms of the bigger dream of Africa, it's not adding value to the socio-economic well-being and need of Africa. It's very focused on what's happening on the Zambezi Valley and Tet. 
but it is there and it's going to take a future. Imperial is not good at starting new businesses. We acquire businesses and capacity and then we will grow that capacity. The, the, the corridors they're looking at is from Tabuchi. Then they say to me, but they have the, skip, the ship jacking as we have car jacking in South Africa. Uh, they very quickly explained to me that we mustn't worry too much about that. They'll sort that out. The high growth area in the next 10 years is going to be in that region between Mombasa and Addis Ababa. And Tabuchi down the Addis Corridor and then from Mombasa up. That red dot on the top just below Sudan is a river port. And that's the beginning, uh, beginning of Lake Tanganyika where Burundi and Rwanda can, uh, get together. Yeah, there's a war in, uh, in Rwanda, so we put on bulletproof vests when we go up there. But something must happen. The next key corridor is the Dar es Salaam corridor to the, to the Central Africa. Again, it runs into Lake Tanganyika. And then the Tazara corridor. The Tazara corridor, the road is moderate to good, the rail is good. Uh, the Chinese did upgrade some of that line, only 11% of the product is running on rail from Dar es Salaam. So you can imagine what the trucks are doing to the road, which is not good. So you've got to start sweeping traffic back to rail. Through Tanzania and with the Zambian government, we were just uh, advised today uh, to be there next Thursday. As they want us to look at running and looking at the rail line, the Dazara corridor, upgrading the, the Kaza Bay uh, river port, uh, and then also inland terminals, Rusaka, Chapiri and extending rail line from Lusaka to Katima Malilo and then from the Namibian side from Katima Malilo to Grootfontein where the rail stops in Namibia. Then it's got an open rail channel all the way to Walters Bay. So there's a lot of activity happening up in Africa. If you look at Addis Ababa just, or the Buchi just for instance, they're currently running about 390,000 TU through that port. They believe that they'll be running anywhere between a million and 1.2 million containers 18 months from now through that port. So 95% of the growth they say is going to happen on that Aras Northern Corridor, moderate growth on the Central Dazara Corridor, and then low growth, or like that's what they say, they call it low growth down on the Maputo side. They want to bring the traffic for Africa into Africa port. That's their dream. They will never swing all the traffic there, but they certainly will gain some of the traffic. So growth will take place there. This is Imperial's uh, business offering in Africa. This is what we presented to Africa. From an infrastructural perspective, we will look at terminals, putting up terminals, we'll look at rail, we'll look at trucking, we'll look at rolling stock, we'll look at barging operations. We'll create the infrastructural focus and deal with it. From a service perspective, international uh, transportation and contract logistics. We are as big in Europe as we are here. And uh, the expertise that we have in Europe, we can apply to the gateways we are currently starting to design and will design and push for that design on the Africa continent in the region. That's just quickly the business offering. Some of the essential deliverables, I've just got a couple of points down there, but the one thing we learned, just coming back to what Sally says, uh, the ability, we, because we're in South Africa, if we acquire a company or you start a company, you've got the letters of intent, you've got the contracts, you've got three years audited financial statements from, from uh, the auditing organizations, um, you have current month-to-date management accounts. Now, when you get to Africa, it changes a little bit. They have two sets of management accounts. One that goes to the auditors. Am I right, Sally? Am I right? One goes to the auditors, and the other one is for tax. And they only give to the king what the king needs, what they think the king needs. <laughs> now, we've got to go buy a company. I'll give you an example. We're talking to a company we want to buy. It's about 380 million rand. And we're having a chat about the discussion, and we don't know how to deal with this. We're wondering if the man's got capital. He then buys another company quickly for 20 million cash. So I said, well, he's got the cash, but it's not what his documents are saying. So very difficult in Africa to get by that. So you've got to start do, doing a little bit of gut feel. So you're going to do things without the usual security. So I think your whole r risk matrix in terms of doing business in Africa has to be totally redefined. All right? They say uh, high risk, high returns. <laughs> But with that, I think one out of ten successful, nine out of ten fall. That's what's been happening basically in Africa. All I'm trying to say there is there's a lot of coal there. And what it is as well is uh, not only uh, steam coal, thermal coal, but also coping coal, which is, as you know, used for the iron ore industry, steel industry. So it is, uh, and some of the, the concession holders like Incondesi, which is uh, one of the coal operations there, at the moment is sitting with thermal coal, steam coal, 
and it's hoping to find the coping coal where the, where the value really lies. So, um, so both, a lot of them are using, as in the next thing, Yamaotis and Vale. Uh, Yamaotis is the, is the concession held by Vale of Brazil. And that's, those are the big players. Vale is the big boy, in, uh, without a doubt. Problem is, guys, lots of coal, how the hell do you move it? That is the bottom line problem. Okay, and you can't move coal by, by, by road truck, obviously. So you have to think of rail. So therefore, there's a center. But the center railway line is hopelessly inadequate for what has to happen. They found too much coal there, in a way. So it, that is what everybody, and that's why a lot of the juniors, the impression one gets is that a lot of the juniors are just waiting in the, in the wings. Some of the concessions have probably worked for the simple reason that they're waiting to see the logistics situation be, get fixed up. The, the, the project that Riversdale was talking to us a lot about was the Zambezi project, which they say is the big upcoming project, um, which they weren't too specific about, but at the moment is a, a drilling program going on. By the way, one of the key categories of clients there are the drillers. There are quite a few drillers there. And I'll, you'll see I have a slide later on, on those drilling companies because they are very busy, very busy. There's a lot of drilling activity, especially on the Zambezi project, which is the next uh, concession. Then uh, the, perhaps the, 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 the smallest of this, but nevertheless a player, is in Polesi. These Indian guys that are waiting, you see surface coal for JSPL, these Indian concessions, not active and on SR, you know, a lot of reasons for that maybe, but there's a lot of positioning going on at the moment. Minash uh, Ravugwe of Australia, it's Talbot with Nippon Steel as the off taker, is also there. This Baobab iron ore that was announced uh, recently, uh, I, I heard that most of the geologists I spoke to don't believe that that project will fly. Um, they just think that the ore body is not good enough and you know, give a lot of technical reasons for it. But, but if it was to be there, we're having iron ore as well, together with coking coal means that you have steel possibilities and so on. So there's a huge need for hotels and, and that kind of construction. The hotel VIP with uh, four stars, the site is there, it's already up, it's already boarded up around there, in Tep, next to the, not far from the Zambezi Hotel, which is the old traditional hotel. And uh, it's going up, and you see the 88 rooms. It's actually a Portuguese company uh, that has it. Portuguese and the Brazilians are very strong in tent. Uh, they really are. The bridge is being done by Teixeira Duarte. Uh, Suarez da Costa is doing that, that hotel. And Monte Angel is doing the other big project, the next bridge. I want to come to bridges later on, because that's a big subject in tent. Bridges, that bridge controls your life. Um, housing developments, plenty. They're all over the place. But there's one there, 160 units uh, for Vale being built by the Chinese, just behind the park-in. The park-in is being built by one of the, the uh, what's the name again, Rush, Rushdale. And there's a third hotel that people are murmuring about. Nobody really knows properly, but the, the site is just further down from the, from the VIP on the other side of the river, when, once you cross that bridge. And then, um, if you don't know Tess, it's hard for me to explain it to you, but it's, for those who know Tess, it's on the main town side of the of the bridge where the town is. Um, so basically there, there, there is the land there, it's being cleared, but we, there's a lot of secrecy about that third hotel. And then uh, housing developments, business park in Moatis, um, that's, a, that's something that the CPI, the Investment Promotion Center, is trying to push. It definitely has to happen, because I don't see guys how the hang this is going to carry on like this. There, there, there has to be a lot of infrastructure. There are too many people pouring into that place. That, that it means that, that there has to be sports centers and all kinds of things. The experts they are having a hard time, I can tell you. It's, um, it, it, they're battling to find accommodation themselves and, and, and so on. By the way, people, are, people are, are pushing up prices now because what's happening is uh, some of the people are sitting on the, on the property and letting it appreciate so that the, high, the property prices are right. That, that being said, uh, land outside of, um, of Tet is still amazingly reasonable. But right inside Tet and in that area, it's going up by the day. Your price goes because they're holding the speculator. And uh, that's going to be a problem in the future. <coughs> ShopRite is to open in April. There's already the site there. It's next to the, uh, the Standard Bank building, just across the road from it. And, uh, and then the rumors of pick and pay starting. You know, pick and pay is on this big Africa drive, and I heard rumors of that. And just a little sideline on the agriculture side, I was so impressed with Mozambique, Mozambique leaf tobacco. What they're doing, those guys really are doing a good operation. I've used a lot of agricultural projects. They have a massive small growers program of about 12,000 small growers. And, um, and it, 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 it really is well coordinated, well run. Um, the Samora Michelle Bridge is that bridge that everybody talks about, uh, where you have to wait in queues to get to the other side. But believe me, it's a big problem. Now, that's why they're building the next bridge, which is further down on the Zambezi. 
which is going to be done by Monte Angel, the Portuguese contractor. And they've already thrown the first stones and foundations to do that third bridge. And that'll be a big project. And that's very necessary. This place is going nuts. Absolutely nuts. Um, you really, uh, you've got to get in early in all these places. You know, if you're too late, you're going to be, I don't know, swamped up. Okay, then um, electrical installations, Kent, New International Airport. Hey, there's an interesting story. The airport's actually not so bad. It doesn't have air conditioning, but it's not so bad, actually. But uh, it has a problem. It's sitting on the cold. <laughs> so, so they're going to have to move the airport. So uh, that means another big opportunity, new airport. So, um, so it's sitting on the coal, and it's part of that Zambezi uh, project, that, 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 that concession. All right, logistics. Wow, this is an issue. Okay, and we'll hear more from Imperial about this. But Zimbabwe, everywhere, just about everybody I spoke to said Zim was the most preferred route. That's what they told me. Okay, uh, clearly you might disagree, whatever. There's some of the prices that I picked up from them. Four days, 50,000 Rand per container as truckload. Maputo is a second, definitely second place to the guys I spoke to as an alternative. Uh, Demarage charge is quite high for the delays at the warehouses. The Beira corridor, the center line being limited by its capacity to take the loads. And therefore, uh, with the big loads that are, that are being uh, touted by Vale and so on, uh, it is a problem. And uh, you, know, you can only get so much out of that line. And then, of course, Nakala is the other one where um, where the um, Vale has bought shares in the Nakala Corridor Company. So guess guess what option they're looking at? They wouldn't have done it. Done it for rocket science. So that's just to work that out. And then uh, Zambezi River. People are very, most people are very negative about the barging option. One good thing, eh? More flights to Tip direct. Nice work, eh? Now we've just from the 26th. It was SA Express that did its first flight, its inaugural flight in there. I had to go via Beira and heaven knows where else, and, um, and Maputo to get back, there and back. But I'll tell you, Lamb was 100% on time, by the way. Everybody says it's a miracle. The difficulties I were picked up or encountered, liaison with Bale, very difficult, very stringent access rules and things like that, understandably, but nevertheless, it's a problem. Heavy stock requirement, notably cranes, crane hire from South Africa is available, but uh, everybody needs cranes. Smaller stock, there's the opportunity. There's a great need for smaller equipment uh, outlets there because of um, there's a gap there. So um, maybe Louis will quite comment on that. A shortage of spares, inferior Asian products often on, on the market, rising prices. People were saying generally that everything in Tet is about 40% more expensive than else else than elsewhere most of it because of various things. 40%, say 20 percent depends on the on the on the commodity, on the product. That speculation I mentioned earlier on. And uh, you know, 50,000 rand USD per hectare without water, power and water without service. And conflicting land claims. The municipality will issue land, and then the, the mining guys will issue the, the same land. And then there's a big argument. Mosambic regulations, of course you're going to have bureaucracy there. But funny enough, I spoke to a lot of people, they said it's not that bad. Eh? You know, they said it's perfectly surmountable. It's, it's a hassle, but it's not like, you know, Angola or something. Um, Immigration or quotas, sliding scale, starting from 100 locals equals 10 expats. So they watch uh, that a lot. Power water supply problems, air generators going all the time. Water's an issue, power's an issue, as you can expect. And north of the Zambezi, no domestic water. A hogging of limited supplies by majors. That's a problem for the smaller guys. Like Bale will just take the contract, take it all up. Just like they take the rooms up in the hotels. So they will take up supply and so on, so the smaller guys struggle that like the barges on the and if we use the barges one of the barges is owned by Vale so there, there's an issue so um, and then uh, framework supply agreements where there's already signed five-year agreements with the big the big players therefore it's hard to get in so that is a thing alleged slow payment from miners every miner I spoke to except me you know so I don't know I'm just telling you what I was told uh, that the miners are not too quick in fact um, accommodation problems I've gone through that fly by nights plenty of fly. some positives Right, firstly, opportunities, please. This, somebody said to me, why would I go to Tet? It's a mining place. Well, who gives a fig? It could be in uh, vegetables or something. You know, it, everything's creating business. So, so who cares whether you're a miner or not? You know, so, uh, or, or directly related to mine. The uh, land availability is, as I say, on the outskirts of Tet, they're still uh, relatively cheap from the municipality, as I was told. Uh, manageable levels of bureaucracy re re regulation, I said that. Good artisanal tradesmen, but you know where a lot of these guys are coming from? From Zimbabwe. 
That's why you go in, and by the way, there's another asset. I mean, I can speak some Portuguese, and I, I was using it a bit, but, but you actually don't have a major problem in tech with language. Um, most of your, a lot of, even the good artisans are from Zim, so they speak very good English. So it, language is unlike, not such a huge problem. It's great to speak, don't get me wrong, to speak Portuguese would be very good, but it's not like a huge limitation um, there, as it is in some other places. Um, banking facilities, standard banks there, FNB, Barclays, African Banking Corporation. Uh, there's ATMs there, but except that they don't work, but, uh, but they're there. Um, more direct flights, supportive expat community. Oh, you go to the watering holes, everybody is on site. It's like, a, it's like, it's like the wild west, you know. Everybody wants to help one. You know, yes, there are some, some crooks. Of course there are. One pub we went to, we were told not to make ourselves too frequent there because other people associated with the owner. It was a bit uh, dicey. So uh, decision making, sometimes centralized in Maputo. Sometimes you'd have to go to Maputo. To, even though that's where it's happening, you'd have to go and see uh, Sir Bale in Maputo to, to get the, the answer. So that is, I don't know, is that advantage or disadvantage? I think it's more an advantage because we all go to Maputo all the time. Okay, so, uh, so that, that's my honest... Consultancy work is end-to-end -end, um, contract sales where I'll be approached by certain procurement departments based in South Africa or the country managers based in whatever country in Africa and they'll look for very specific suppliers that I can link them up to um, and then obviously facilitation of, com of companies that are wanting to come into Tanzania but don't want to set up a fully full-blown entity from day one. Then also on top of that we have a lot of project governance and a, a lot of operational cleanups and process flows that we ask to do in the, in the sense of operational effectiveness in Tanzania is very much based on needs as opposed to wants. So it's usually quite a short period of time and it really is a very intense day by day operational cleanup. From um, my perspective, the international business development and the scope of who you meet not being in South Africa is far greater in any one African country. Having come from telecoms here, I was never exposed to the type of global players that I've been exposed to up there. Um, here in a corporate environment, the group exec, sorry for any of you in the room, tend to keep those people very close to themselves. So up there, um, in the expats environment, you do tend to meet a lot more people that can open up opportunities for you, which is actually brilliant because you, you realize that, unfortunately, you can look at South Africa from a bit of an outside-in perspective. And South Africans have got quite insular, and um, they, don't often, they co often come with a bit of arrogance attached. We've seen it in telecoms quite a lot, and it has got better. There are about 20,000 South Africans, they say, working in Tanzania at the moment, but I'm not quite sure if that's more 10 to 12,000 permanent and the rest are consultants and mining and telecoms coming in and out, which is quite possible. But um, definitely uh, we've got a lot of skills to offer and there are a lot of South African businesses doing extremely well up there and a lot that have crashed and burned. So um, as much as it's known to be a much easier environment to work in than a Nigeria or a Sierra Leone or a DRC, it definitely has its own realities that one has to face. Um, you know, the realistic um, operational expectations and governance that you need to look at there is expenditure, your cost, of, your cost of doing any one infrastructure project, you can look at three times what you would budget for. Anything that goes in the ground in Tanzania will cost you three times as much as you expect it to mainly because we have a lot of difficulties on transport. Plant hire is hard to come by and the ports and rail and road are to some points the blocking points are inaccessible to get your towers in, your fibre in, whatever you're trying to bring in to get your project to run. Plus we are, once the rain starts in Tanzania, your history, everything stops because um, there's a lot of infrastructure and I'll talk about that a bit later which is, which is particularly difficult to deal with. Succession planning is a huge um, a huge problem for a lot of companies coming into Tanzania. The license conditions is quite punitive in some aspects. 18 months and you've got to have full succession planning done of all your expats out, which a lot of companies find very difficult to do at financial director and management, managing director level. Um, micromanagement is a must, it's <coughs> just a given. And um, obviously a lot of global entities coming in, come in with a very much a silo approach and they, they miss the whole micromanagement view and a lot of what they do gets lost in that whole global approach. So it's, it's quite important to align yourself 
no matter how big you are, with the people that are doing it correctly in whatever country you're going into. I think the biggest thing in Tanzania is to achieve operational effectiveness within the constraints of the logistical difficulties that you will face. Basically, I've just looked at sector opportunities as I see it. Um, obviously, telecoms is one that I can talk about, and it is definitely a main driver um, in any one country, particularly Tanzania, where we've got a lovely price war. So when I come back to South Africa, I'm horrified at the network quality, and I'm horrified at the prices that you're paying. Uh, on data as well as, as call rates. The average Tanzanian's got two to three SIMs with two to three operators, and obviously there's a huge influx of very cheap handsets. Um, obviously because of the, the fixed line infrastructure not being um, as good as it should be, cellular once again is driving even banking, um, giving people access to money in very remote areas. The fiber infrastructure that's been laid, um, the original one by TTCL, which was done in conjunction with Chinese partners and is being sold off in, in bits to um, a lot of operators that are coming in are looking at that because it's already a line that can be leased. There are maintenance issues on that line already. In Tanzania, if you own a tower or a billboard, you're in business. There's a tower, you can learn to drive in Tanzania by the number of towers there are and billboards. So, there's been very little environmental, serious environmental control on how many towers have been put up or how many billboards have been put up. So the next phase in this mature market, which is, is global, but particularly in Tanzania, is managed services and infrastructure sell-offs. So um, the next stage that we're all expecting is the sell-off of the physical infrastructure, which to startup engineers is very scary because that is what they believe their core product is. And obviously to the, to, to the bean counters, it's, it's about airtime. So we're waiting for that first deal. American Towers obviously want a deal here in South Africa, but Helios, Eaton Towers, all those, those players are very, taking Tanzania very seriously because we expect one of those infrastructure sell-offs to happen in the next three months. Um, the rights of ways, you can have a, a letter from a government agency like we had on the Vodacom project saying they've got a national route going in. When you go district to district, you will have to get your own rights of ways. Mm -hmm. So that delays you quite a lot. As well as regulatory and statutory applications for you as a contractor, an expatriate contractor, you will be hounded every single day on that project about any of your statutory or regulatory requirements. And there's a lot of development in the banking sector currently. Um, obviously, there's a huge need for contract finance uh, to be accessible to corporates coming into Tanzania, as well as most uh, infrastructure projects there, you have to have performance bonds and performance guarantees from local insurance companies and from or from local banks. Usually if it's from banks, they tie up your capital, which none of us can afford. So there's that whole space that has not really been looked at and, and is, has got a lot better in the last three years, but it's nowhere near it where it needs to be. Power. Obviously power for us and alternative sources of power is a massive challenge. Every business, every house, every school, every, every, every entity has a generator. You're on four hours a day on average on generator, four days a week. So your, your, power, your power problems in Tanzania are massive. Your grid, your grid failures are huge. Alternative power has its place, but we've yet to see there's a bit of natural gas, there's a lot of nat uh, alternative power and natural gas and that being looked at. A lot of hybrids have been looked at in telecoms as well, but nothing that's been positively 100% effective at this stage. Millennium Challenge is on, which is, is part of a huge rural electrification project, which is fantastic and I think going to be very well governed. But um, obviously, you know, any form of power challenges affect manufacture, it also affects you from a, every perspective in an infrastructure development. Mining. Tanzania has still got an abundance of natural resources, so that's a, it's a huge industry up there and it brings a whole lot of other industries with it. Why I've brought service delivery in is because the government is under huge pressure at the moment to deliver on a lot of projects. There is a lot of donor funding also available for projects that will ensure service delivery to the end user. So um, in education, the private networks being built, the VoIP networks and initiatives going in, um, in, in, um, in warehousing, distribution, logistics, and obviously they're upgrading the, the airport, they're, they've upgraded the port, and there's a lot more coming with that upgrade um, in the form of security and tracking of containers, which is a real problem to make sure the containers are not opened and closed and absolutely fleeced before they get to Zambia. So there, there is a lot of construction going on in Tanzania and a lot of opportunities within that portfolio. Having said that, um, the realities are 30% of the budget goes to corruption and 30% of the budget is funded by donors. 
So donors are saying, get your act together on corruption, otherwise, and get your act together on economic reform for the people in the street, otherwise the donor funding is coming to an end. So that's why you'll see a lot of donor funders now wanting governance right to the end, like with the Millennium Challenge, where they've literally had an audit team on it from day one. Uh, the government is very aware of corruption. It was one of the main drivers in the last election. They are aware that, the, that there was a lot of voter apathy and a lot of it was based on the fact that corruption is so high. Obviously, we've spoken about the power cuts, which are debilitating. If you're based in Dar es Salaam and the temperature is 50 times worse than, uh, than Durban in February, and you're in a two-hour uh, traffic jam because the roads are bad, and it starts to rain, and you go home and there's no power, let me tell you, <laughs> you have no productivity level <laughs> whatsoever. So um, the roads, the infrastructures, the roads need, there's no drainage in, in, in Dar es Salaam itself. Um, once it rains, the roads are completely flooded. Um, the, the, the rail, I haven't had a lot to do with rail, but I know that seems to run reasonably well. Port, huge, huge delays at port. Um, everybody's put, mi put money into the mining industry. I know years ago put a lot of money in to facilitate everything coming through the port a lot quicker. We still face huge delays, whether it's air, road, or, or, or port. So we're hoping that a lot of these upgrades are going to improve things. But once again, it goes back to the top one, and it goes back to the lack of transport to get whatever you're bringing in to your guys in the field or wherever you're building whatever infrastructure you're building. Um, obviously, the lack of town planning and drainage is a huge problem. If you go and do any civil works project and you ask the town planning department for utilities of anything, whether it's power, whether it's underwater drainage, whether it's uh, water, they can't give it to you. So a lot of the time you can do a survey, but you can do whatever survey you like, you're still blind. So then we move on to obviously, as I said before, logistics, distribution and product to market, very ineffective. We've got very competitive local pricing models on labor contracting and supply from local subcontractors that have grown incredibly in the last three years. Uh, Chinese pricing models in Tanzania are just bringing the margin so low on some of the infrastructure projects you actually can't even do the job. And quality standards. If you're a company that has quality standards, wants to maintain them, it's very difficult against those kinds of margins, especially if you're bringing ex expats in to do the, for, for us on Fiverr, the blowing and splicing, to bring expats from South Africa to do that work, your margins are just blown out the water. Obviously, there's a lot of competition now from Ugandan and the Kenyan neighbors, and the Tanzanians are particularly sensitive to that. The way forward, all I can say to you is three times your original capital outlay. Choose your staff appropriately and very wisely. It may not be in Nigeria, but it has its own problems and a lot of expats don't realize that. Tanzania has been very well cloaked by tourism and people think you sit on Zanzibar every weekend. The average expat in Dar works 12 hours, seven days a week. So you need to, and coming up with your family or without your family has its pros and cons. Um, I always say be SADC and East African wise, choose your, your tax and legal partners very carefully. There are very few practical legal and, um, and accounting firms that can give you practical advice on both. And sometimes you need, as, as Bernard has said, someone in that country because it's impossible to do everything from South Africa. And in actual fact, it's sometimes a massive disadvantage. Um, I always say align yourself with business partners that are doing it right and that are doers and not talkers and that they are competent in their local experience. Saturation in any product or any service you bring into Tanzania is very short-lived. There's someone chasing you all the time on that product or on that, that, that um, service or on that infrastructure to beat and get, get your client away from you. Lay a footprint well and pay for good market research on the ground before you invest in any entity or sector. And stay in the sector that you're most comfortable in. Um, a lot of companies come up there and they say insecurity and they'll see, oh, there's a nice opportunity there and they move sectors and they, they fail dismally in those sectors. And we've seen it in fiber. The guys that come up and do blowing and splicing, that's what they do. They don't touch the civil works because that's their speciality. So um, I've seen a lot of regulatory improvements, mainly in telecoms in the last three years. Uh, environmental is becoming really environmental in that it is about the environment as opposed to how much money they can get from environmental. We are foreseeing some labor changes and a lot more of a unionized environment coming through. Um, but um, that's, that's going to take a while to come through in itself. Um, it is quite a labor, and any infrastructure there is quite labor intensive. On about 100 kilometers of fiber, we had 420 laborers a day. So just on, and that's not a, that's not a, a, a big distance. So um, 
just on that, there are a lot of opportunities there. Do your homework very well. And there are some really phenomenal South African companies doing exceptionally well there. And they're not all big boys. They're all, some of them are, are really in the, in the middle. And they're making a lot of money. And they've built good businesses. They've been there 10 years. So, you know, it's really important, as Paul says, and take advantage of any of the trade visits that are going to happen to Tanzania. And, um, and I hope I haven't put you off too much with the realities, but unfortunately, that's what exists.